Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another presentation as a part of the Berkshire High Peaks Festival. This festival is brought to you by Close Encounters with Music, and my name is Carolyn Regula, and I will be your host today, slash cellist, hence the handy dandy microphone for today's masterclass. All of the sessions are being recorded and will be live streamed on YouTube as well. Even after our master classes and lectures air on Zoom, you can still find the footage archived on the Close Encounters with Music YouTube channel. And we encourage you all to subscribe so you can be staying up to date and seeing our latest videos. Please consider supporting Close Encounters with Music in our ongoing festival. Our mission is to engage the imagination of diverse concert audiences in a welcoming setting, to connect listeners to performers and composers, and foster the excitement and sense of community that live performance builds. Also to establish a comfortable listening environment and turn performances into enriching educational and artistically uplifting experiences. I will be including a donation link in the chat window below. You can use the chat window to communicate with yourselves throughout the presentation. If you have a question for today's presenter, please use the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. I will be monitoring that throughout the presentation and relaying questions to our presenter today. We are so excited to have you all join us this morning. And to welcome our speaker, I have Close Encounters Artistic Director, Yehuda Hanani. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Carolyn. It is a pleasure to uh, start today with um, an unusual guest, uh, a fellow cellist and a fellow adventurer Jeffrey Ziegler, Ziegler, who was a member of the Kronos Quartet for a number of years, and he really has his, he has his fingers on the pulse of contemporary music. He probably also has a crystal ball and can tell us where music is heading in the future, because I know that he, he is going to uh, be full of interesting information. Um, good morning, Jeffrey, and welcome. Good morning, Yehuda. Hello. Uh, great to have you with us. Maybe I have a few, not so much questions, but I hope that you will touch on certain subjects. Maybe I can tell you my expectations, my hopes, before you even start, and then you can probably weave them into your talk. Um, no, no, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> As, as my friend says, the pressure is mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's still a stigma about contemporary music. Mm -hmm. uh, for you, for me, I know there, is, there are only two categories. There's good music and there's bad music. That's, these are the only two divisions we make. But maybe you can explain a little bit what is behind that stigma and how we can overcome it. Um, can tell us about what it was like over the years to work with very gifted composers. Uh, what was the input? What was the, the chemistry between performers and writers? Um, what, how do you feel about mixed media? You know, music plus film plus dance, whatever else is, gets, gets into the mix. Um, maybe you can tell us where do you think music is heading? which is a big question for all of us. Um, as, and, long as, as long as it's the discussion about where music is heading and not where the world is heading. Oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> right. But still, maybe you can touch on what do you think, in your opinion, the pandemic is going to do to world culture and to music, if mm -hmm. you have any thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. um, and one final aspect that I'm very interested in is the relationship between the highbrow and popular music, mm -hmm. and how you bridge them, if you need to bridge them, and all that. So I'm loading you with all sorts of interesting, uh, <laughs> challenging questions. I, I hope you can answer a few of them. Welcome again. Looking very much forward to your presentation. 
Thank you very much, Yehuda. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you and with everyone uh, with the Berkshires uh, Music Festival this morning. Uh, I will hope to uh, address at least most of those uh, questions because they're wonderful thoughts. And uh, in the spirit of baseball season, I think if I can bat 300, I'll, I'll be doing pretty well. Um, <laughs> So the format of this morning's uh, class is going to be a bit of cello and a bit of uh, discussion. Uh, we're going to begin with a, a more formal master class. Uh, our wonderful host is going to perform a, a few movements of the suite from uh, Bill Balkin's um, Suite Number no. One from uh, 1994. Um, and then following that, I have a brief uh, chat, some ideas, hopefully a, a little bit of uh, crystal ball, a uh, few crystal ball moments, we'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, I see Carolyn is ready to go. And so I thought uh, maybe we can begin uh, with this. Are you, um, you said you have two movements prepared or should we just begin with uh, the march, the prelude? Um, I have three. Three. Uh um, the third one goes by in the blink of an eye, though. <laughs> um, so I wasn't sure if you wanted to hear all three movements. I think three. maybe what we should let's begin. Let's begin at the beginning and, and let's see where we are. But I'm sure that I might have one or two thoughts about the prelude. So maybe we can start from the top. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Very exciting. It's a very, very exciting work. And you play it wonderfully. You know, um, listening to you perform, I, I had um, a, a thought, a question, really. Um, as far as this march is concerned, do you have like an image in mind? I mean, obviously it's a march, but... I, I mean, he even writes a la marcha, <laughs> but like, is it like you're watching soldiers marching? Is it like, wh what is your perspective? Is it kind of coming from a distance and going by? Is it sort of, uh, because he has quite a, um, uh, a dynamic range, most of which I might add are subito. So what is your thought? On that um, so actually I've taken kind of a new approach to this piece I imagine do you know the telltale heart by Edgar Allan Poe 
uh, I, I don't know the work. Um, so it's, it's a story um, about a man who commits murder and the police come to his house and he's hidden the crime and his heart is beating throughout the story. And mm. the conscious of that heartbeat drives him to guilt and he actually confesses to the police by the end of the story spoiler alert um but because of all the subito quiet dynamics um mm. i think it's more of an internal march almost like the heart and the panic that weaves in and out of it um so that's kind of my yeah. approach no that's it. that's amazing i love it i love it <laughs> But I think that there, there are two things about what you're describing that I would really love to uh, apply here. Number one, the external versus the internal. And the fact that even in the soft dynamics, it's like really exciting, right? Because he feels this guilt. So even though it's like, boom, boom, it's not like boom, but it's boom, boom, has this intensity inside. So. Yeah, so, uh, something I would love to ask about that is the, the control of the open C string and to yeah. make that more consistent, as you were saying, yeah. um, to get it kind of more dry. So I think, I think that's, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, hmm. That's a tough one because the string is going to ring. Um, but actually let's, let's address that first and then go in reverse because I think, uh, once you, once you find the right mezzo piano, then let's kind of reverse engineer it and find a like a good starting point first. So right off the bat, are you? My first thought is maybe what if what if they were up up like all ups? And and have you thought about? I mean, you've thought about the attack obviously and the the length, but have you thought about? The release. What if the release were quick? Can I hear you play some of those? Yeah, the problem with uh, placing the hair on the string is that you dampen the vibration. So we hear like da, da, da. It almost sounds like it's another note. So unfortunately, it's, you know, it's the same problem in the, um, in the fast, the third movement of the Brahms F minor piano quintet, where if, if you, if you touch the string, then it sounds like there's another note, you know, the, so you have to be very careful about the reattack. I would recommend not worrying about dampening the string. And, and start the stroke from before the string, so you're not you're not stopping it. Just almost like you're um, bouncing a basketball. Even shorter. And one thing I'm doing to to cheat a little bit is I'm getting I'm I'm not on top of the bridge. I'm sort of like there. Anything that we want that's on the dry side, if it's helped out if we get a little closer to the bridge. And then when just kind of thinking ahead, when we do play the loud stuff, that can be a little there. Try attacking it from above. Like just kind of dropping dropping the bow, actually. Of course that's more like pinissimo, but yeah, good. So I think the downbeat should be big. Just to be dramatic. So it's like two different strokes. Yeah, good, good. Now, 
my mistake, the mezzo piano probably shouldn't be too soft so that we can make a really good diminuendo. But um, in the spirit of being guilty of murder and not wanting to give anything away, it's like a totally controlled and almost unnatural mezzo piano, almost mechanical, right? So let's see how cool we can do it. Like really big, but then very, like everything's fine here, right? It's like, no, something's not right. <laughs> And I'm sorry, maybe it's the zoom, but are you going? Th those are two dots, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't quite hear the dots. But really, I would suggest really um, bringing that detail out. And actually, it helps you out because it gets you back to the up bow, up bow land. Can we just start? We can go. Oh, yeah, that's good. from the beginning. No, no, no. The fourth beat of the second bar is good. Yeah. Now, the important thing is that when you return to the mezzo piano, I want you to almost, almost unnaturally get back to the exact same place that you were in on the second beat of the first bar. Almost imagine this, this mezzo piano pulse is steady throughout and you just you, you go crazy da -da 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 -bum, bum, bum, almost like water dripping from the tap yeah the important thing is when you play the the those two ups you have to uh, lighten your hand. If you have any sort of um, squeezing going on, the bow won't bounce, right? So we, on a technical level, we have to release the hand um, to hop. Good, but don't don't diminuendo too soon. Like, oh no, nothing. Everything's fine. Yeah, but <laughs> but with the two dots. That that's that's the uh, the articulation feature that we want. We want. We we want that. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> Which is, it's, it, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but you know, this image that you're, that you've created, it's like, no, everything's cool. What? Uh, yeah, I'm on a D flat now, but what? What? <laughs> so, but you have to sort of give, give that image. Like now it's like, no, I was playing a D flat before. What are you talking about? <laughs> Those are not my fingerprints. <laughs> So let's let's go back. How about the uh, bar five on the fourth beat? Da -da -ba -ba -ba. very hard that's very hard these dynamics are very difficult you're doing an excellent job but you know um, one thing that may help when you're when you're doing this is maybe aim for even softer than piano right 
it's it's very difficult to do. But if we aim p past p piano to like pianissimo, you might hit piano. And if you hit piano, then it'll sound like this. Right? It, like very cool. It'll it'll seem very not like cool like awesome, but like just keep a cool head, right? Just be cool, act cool, right? Um, also, so that we're able to, right? There's that that feature that we want to show, right? So can we go back? How about just measure ten then? Good, good. That that was great. And and you can keep going. How about just from the um the second beat of twelve? Uh sec second repeat going on. Oh, um can I hear the first? Um I'm I wanna listen for one thing. <laughs> That, that is such a gnarly um, let's see how do I say this don't be in a rush and even though it's fortissimo you know if if you um, if you rush and if you squeeze some of that chromaticism we, we kind of lose the We, we lose those contours a little bit. So um, just actually, I, I would even suggest feeling like you're spreading it out in a very lyrical way. Forte, but lyrical. Can we try that? Are you going to the second beat of 13 or the third beat of 13? I'm trying to make it the third beat. Good, right? But in a weird sort of way, tech, uh, just kind of speaking cello technique, we almost want to go to the second beat, but it's right. the third beat. Yeah. Make, make that super clear as well. Yeah, 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 good. So, with that in mind, can you go back to the second beat of 12 and let's take the second ending. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. That's what I was wondering about. So the dynamics are different. Yeah. So here too, especially since you're coming from fortissimo, and then you go back to fortissimo. The bit in the middle, for those of you who don't have your Bulkham scores out, it's marked mezzo piano. Um, I'm not, it goes by quickly. There's a lot of gymnastics going on. Here too, I would suggest overshooting mezzo piano. Make it a very clear contrast. Maybe piano, maybe even softer, right? But how, how much air can you let out of the tires on the... And, and really make it light. Can we hear what that sounds like? Carolyn, that sounded great, and I heard every note perfectly crystal clear, right? So, first of all, I'd like to say I would love to have that kind of crystal clarity on the fortissimo on the first ending, right? In addition, can it be even softer for the second ending? Like maybe use half as much bow. Ah, whoa, wow. I mean, that was great. If you have in, if you can even go further in that direction, that would, that would actually be even more dramatic, especially when you come in with the fortissimo. So, Last time, and we can go on. But, but you know what? 
Uh, it's a solo cello piece. So even though it's a march and we want things to be very steady, we need it to be steady in the pulse sense, not the metronomic sense. So where I'm going with that is that you don't have to keep it in time on the third beat of the second measure. I mean, yes, you do have to keep it in time, but not so strictly. And because what I'm hearing is a crescendo to the fortissimo. And I think you can actually highlight the dynamic a little bit and we won't think, oh my gosh, she's so slowing down, right? You don't have to stay with the viola player's eighth notes or something like that. So go ahead and make, do what you need to do to make it clear. Maybe that was a little bit too much, but that's exactly the idea. That's exactly the idea. We definitely heard the dramatic uh, character and dynamic change. So, excellent. So, this next bit, I have to admit, I was kind of like eyeballing this. And I wonder, if you end up down bow... I mean, yes, you have the, the harmonic. The, for those of you who are wondering, this A, there's a tie over, or a slur into, into the pits. And I just wonder, there's only so much we can do, and there's only so much we can rely on the, harm, the ring of the harmonic. I wonder if it should be up bow. So, so that the motion is going into the pits, and you're probably thinking, Carolyn, Wait, how do I get there? That looks really hard. I think in order to get there, you might need to consider to, to not do the, not to do the up, up, but to do it separately. It's something to think about. You want to try it? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> But rather than thinking of the only the attack of the the, but actually think of it connecting into the pit. So very long A. In fact, in fact, he probably wants it to almost have a crescendo. So it goes, it goes into the pits. And there too. Yeah, it's almost like one note, not bum, bum. Dear, wom, da da, wom. Like one gesture. And just make sure that the 16th notes are late. Da dum, da dum, not da dum, da da. It's getting slightly triplety. Good. Now something new. Pianissimo. Good. I had a question about that. In the measure 17 on the fourth beat, what notes are you playing? Sorry. That's clearly a mistake. But are you playing an A G sharp or an A flat G natural? A A flat G natural. Okay. It's a, it's a misprint in the in the part. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So can I hear it one more time? <laughs> your hand feel when you're playing this? It feels a little scrambly, which might yeah. be why it, it needs to, I, I'm now seeing the trend, it has to lighten up. I have to consciously lighten up whenever I see the double up. Yeah, but you know, maybe, can we try something? Um, let's do it under tempo. 
And I want you to not only lighten it up on the two dots, lighten up on the whole thing. And the only difference between the slurs and the up ups is that for the slurred ones, rather than um, whatever the opposite of lightening up is, rather than doing that, feeling weight. So it's like a. But it's always it's always light in the hand. So just a little heaviness. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'm trying to think. Can the, can the slurs be a little heavier still? And what I'm hearing is that the second slur, the second note under the slur, is a little short. Maybe if it were. A little bit more of that character, almost lopsided. I think what I might be hearing, if I could um, project a little bit, the up ups sound very intent. And what I would like to hear is a little bit more of, eh, like, I don't care. <laughs> like, just sort of like, you're, you're just kind of like, not even skipping rocks, it's more like you're just dropping them. Just drop the bow. And, and just to point out, it sounds clearer when it, it sounds clearer when you don't care. <laughs> so, so now let's do the same thing, just a touch faster. Yeah, that sounds great. Now, do you want to try it um, in context? Right. So the challenge here, right, it's like an up, the piece is an obstacle course. And here at this moment, the challenge is how quietly can you play it? That's pretty good. Pretty good. Let's go on. have to be super soft. I wonder, do you think that eighth note should be short? Or it sounds sneakier when it's short, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of question that I and this well actually this isn't what I was planning on talking about in the talk talking part, but these little details, I do find that composers are open-minded. But something to think about if you want to, you know, something that sounds very ominous. <clears throat> Guilty. 
<laughs> Good. So it, it's more than just um, a dynamic contrast. It's like, I don't know, a it's more than a character contrast. It's like an attitude contrast where when, when it's really soft, it's like, like, just be still, you know. If, I, if I'm really quiet and I'm really still, there's no way that anyone would know that I'm guilty, which makes no sense. But, you know, what do I know about murder? So uh, for, I, I know we're, we at s very soon we should probably move to the next segment, but I'm, I would love to hear some of the second movement if we can. Sure, my pleasure. just talk about that much i'm i'm almost afraid to ask but what is your image for this one <laughs> it's, it's a lot more pleasant i promise um i i see this as very um ritualistic almost um kind of like a tribal call and response type with especially the uh <laughs> almost like a like a more exotic embellished chant mm. mm -hmm. it seems um the whole thing seems quite intense um and I just wonder, like the very opening, he writes Espressivo. Um, and kind of thinking of it in context, it's coming from this, you know, all this, uh, all that stuff. Maybe this has a little bit more of a broad feel, mm. you know, instead of like a... You know, something that's very, uh, sorry, be natural. Maybe it could have more of a. Something more open. It's very um, delicate. I don't know. It's it's a little um, contrasting in a way with with your image, but maybe if there's a way to kind of have both work together, I like the freedom. Um, I, I guess I'm just wondering how how broadly do you feel comfortable? making some of these sounds and some of these strokes. Could you try it one more time? Because also I'm, I'm seeing a lot of a you know, like all these things. They, it 
looks like he's trying to activate a lot of resonance on the instrument. And so I just wonder if part of the experience of is to create something that's very ringy, something that's very open sounding on the cello rather than kind of sustained and maybe almost kind of sound, like maybe something that's more open. With pieces like this, um, Mr. Ziegler, it's hard for me to take my own natural character out. <laughs> and, and, and you should Intensity. <laughs> and you shouldn't. And you shouldn't. This should be like, you know, your voice, your version of openness. <laughs> And there's where the intensity can suddenly appear, like a, like a rocket, like all of a sudden, can we go back to the, so just knowing where you want to go on this run, where, where do you want to be here? First of all, that was great. Uh, I liked when you brought it back to the opening material, but here it was more intense, but that was okay. I thought that was good, actually. But my question is for this one. It's still just mezzo forte. Very true. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, even, yeah. Though, even though I guess I'm okay with the forte, just for for the for the audience it, when the material comes back it's slow again it's marked the same way forte i think i'm more okay emotionally with that having a little bit more intensity but i'm not so sure if the yadam dadam should be too aggressive right. okay. yeah <laughs> very good it's very good the the last thing I'd like to mention here is just a question this is the sort of uh, thing that I always love um, to think about and I like to discuss with composers living composers when I approach their music as I'm looking at these runs it's just one example the first run he writes six tuplets with an accelerando. Actually landing on a top note that's short and then a fermata on the rest. This one right here that you just played, it starts out as 16th notes that become six tuplets, that become septuplets. So he's written in a kind of a cello rondo. Right. But then they become 16th notes at the top and then instead of having the top note short, it's a long note with the fermata on the note itself rather than on the rest that follows. So what does that mean? I mean, I think it's very clear that he wants the first one to and then to wait and then go on to the next thing. For the second one, da da, it's almost like he wrote one, one of those things. I don't know what the technical term is, but it's like a fan where it gets faster and then slower at the top and then to hold the top note on the fermata. That's very clear. 
But what's the difference between the written out Chalran da 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 and da 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 da? What's the difference in feeling? Um, I like to think he wants the first one to feel a little more rushed, um, a little more active, and because Excel, when it's printed, to within taste, you can make it much faster than it's written. Um, but he writes it out the second time with rhythm. I feel like it should be more lyrical, mm -hmm. um, maybe more right. about um, the line that's happening, the intervals that are happening. And the second time, it's kind of like he rushed through a thought the first time. And now this second time, it's still a hectic thought, but he's more reflective on it, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that that totally works and it's, it's a completely valid thought. I'm just kind of playing a, a game in my mind for the second run, rather than writing a septuplet, he could have written a sextuplet with a little Echel Rondo and then on the, the next bar, instead of having uh, two sixteenth notes, it could have been three sextuplets, yeah. right? So what's the difference? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But it's a fun little it's a fun little puzzle, you know, yeah. and and every composer has to negotiate their kind of translate their thoughts and what they're imagining and somehow put it down with dots and lines on the page. And it's not a bad thing to second guess some things. And quite frankly, I've gotten into some trouble saying this sometimes, but sometimes composers get, get it wrong. You know, sometimes they clearly like they write piano and it's like, are you really sure? I think the piano should be really right here. And, and so it's not a matter of saying that a composer's wrong. I like to joke about it, but really it's getting inside what you believe the composer's true thoughts are in the language of music that we all speak. Because um, our job as performers is to, um, well, make the music that was written successful. You know, we want it to sound great. We want to actually make the compo. We want Bulkum to sound good. So not just ourselves, but the piece. So, um, so these are things to to wrestle with. So, I think um, we should probably move on to the next segment. But I, I want to hear more, maybe. Maybe, uh, maybe in the future, but you know, you sound terrific. And, um, and uh, thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you. No, this is, this is amazing. Um, thank you so, so much. I loved, I loved having the feedback. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, so let's see, how is this going to, should I just begin? I guess I will just begin. I'm going to I'm going to come a little closer to the screen so that there we go. Mr. Ziegler, we actually did have one quick cello related question. Absolutely. Might be a good time to ask right now before we switch. Yes. Um, what are some techniques you can recommend for beginning cello players? Oh gosh. That's that's a very good question. In brief, can you do it in brief? Um, well, I think that there are a couple of things that, um, that we need to, uh, um, kind of, that can help us kind of move in a direction, both for, uh, building cello technique and, you know, more importantly, a love for the instrument. Um, I would recommend, um, you know, getting, getting as early as you can get into um, uh, the sound of the instrument. Of course, you know, with your teacher, you have to, you talk about how to sit at the instrument, the proper uh, sitting position, sitting up straight, the proper height of the instrument. 
Um, but also just getting to know your bow arm a little bit. And I, I don't want it to sound like, oh, you have to, you know, get into the weeds of technique, but just for the ability to play open strings beautifully without tightening up your hand, having a nice, relaxed bow hold, and try to keep the bow straight. Um, it's, you know, playing any stringed instrument is a different challenge at the beginning than say playing the piano because when you play the piano you hit the button then you have a note that's immediately it sounds good and it's in tune we don't have that benefit but we can if we're able to pull a straight bow that's even we can just get to know how the cello rings and the beauty of that sound And so I would say that would be like among the first challenges of playing a stringed instrument because if you're able to pull a straight bow very evenly with a beautiful sound, then you are in fact well on your way to having a good bow arm, right? And that's a major, major part of how we make sound. Uh, so I, of course there are left hand things. Um, I would definitely talk to your teacher about that, maybe play with some tape so you know where the notes are. Um, but I would say the most important thing uh, at every stage of our development as musicians is to make sure that we uh, reinforce our love for the instrument and for, for music. Because especially when we play a stringed instrument, I gotta tell you, it might feel discouraging at, time, at times. I mean, it kind of reminds me of um, this masterclass course I took with uh, the great cello teacher, uh, William Pleath, uh, in England when I was a student. And, um, you know, I think that if you were to uh, have musicians on a spectrum, some that are more, you know, progressive and some that are more kind of conservative, I would definitely put Pleath more on the conservative side of the spectrum. But even for him, he talked about uh, the importance of rather than picking up your cello every morning and turning on the metronome and playing your scales to improvise for a little bit, because um, just to reaffirm the beauty of the instrument and the beauty of the sound of the cello and to keep uh, your relationship with the instrument very positive and motivational and beautiful and um, rather than, you know, okay, I have to do my 50 push-ups and do my sit-ups and have it very task-oriented because that kind of stifles um, love. So um, that's what I would say is lots of open strings and enhancing the beauty uh, of the cello. So for the next segment, I thought I would chat a little bit about the um, strange path that I, I took with music. And along the way, um, you know, there were a lot of discoveries that I made about um, contemporary music and about, um, uh, you know, what, where the limitations are for our instrument and for the, uh, for the field of music. So um, let's start from the, not quite the beginning. <laughs> when I was a student at Eastman in the early 90s, I took a course offered by the saxophone professor Ray Ricker called The Business of Music. I thought it would be a good idea to begin to think about ways to prepare myself for the field of music beyond just practicing my solo pieces and drilling orchestral excerpts. In the class, I learned about resumes, developing contacts, making good first impressions, which, by the way, includes being prepared at the first rehearsal. And he also stressed the importance of not only uh, being on time for gigs, but to actually show up early. Now, fast forward about six years, I've moved to New York and was getting my first real taste of New York freelancing. I was pretty shocked to learn that clearly nobody had taken Ray's class. People were never prepared and forget about being on time. The most common excuse was that there was some issue with the subway, which I always thought was pretty ridiculous because, um, hello, we all took the subway. Uh, and as every New Yorker knows, there's always something wrong with the subway. So I asked the question, what was the point of Ray's class? 
My teacher in graduate school was Paul Katz of the Cleveland Quartet. I consider him to be my chillistic father figure. I learned so much from his artistry as well as from his humanity. One lesson that I never forgot was he told me that I should always be ready for any opportunity because you never know which one is going to click. After receiving my master's degree from Rice University, I continued my studies at Indiana University with the legendary Hungarian cellist Janos Starker. It was there that I also met the group that would define my path out of school. The group was called the Corleano Quartet. And by the way, we were named after the composer John Corleano, not the father, not his father, who was the uh, concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic. We went on to win the grand prize at the Fischoff competition and became the quartet in residence at the Juilliard School. And here is a clip of us playing our signature piece. Probably a good place to actually. I was as I was listening to that clip, I was just remembering that um, the Curliano Quartet was formed at Indiana University under the uh, tutelage of Atar Arad, who I understand was also just gave a master class here at the Berkshires Festival. So uh, it's all it's all in the family, as it were. So living in New York, you are always looking for ways to make some extra dough. A friend of mine told me about a teaching job uh, that was available at a community music school in the West Village. So I faxed over my resume right away. And I never heard back. And eventually I forgot about it. Several months later, I was performing in a house concert on the Upper East Side. Being a member of the Curliana Quartet, I often played John's solo piece whenever he needed some music for an event or an award ceremony. As I was warming up, this man peeked into my room and said he liked my playing a lot. And he told me that he was the director of a community music school in the West Village and that they needed a cello teacher. Of course, I was like, uh, I sent you my resume. Anyway, as my teacher Paul Katz said, you never know how or when things will click. After Juilliard, we had a residency at Dickinson College in central Pennsylvania. 
It was a good run, but after six years, I decided to leave quartet life behind me. So I quit the quartet and I moved back to New York. I gave New York freelancing a real go, and I took about a dozen orchestra auditions. And I decided that I never, ever wanted to play in a quartet ever again. That pledge lasted about six months. And here's the next clip. That was a clip from uh, a film soundtrack that we did called The Fountain. And that was a collaborate, that was music written by Clint Mansell. And the, uh, the band that you heard playing with us is the Scottish band Mogwai. Playing with Kronos taught me an awful lot. Having grown up in the Bay Area, there was never a time in my life that I hadn't known about Kronos. But one of the things I learned was that before they were Kronos, they were exactly like so many other young, struggling string quartets. Their first residency was, and I kid you not, at a restaurant in Oakland. It wasn't a very good gig, but they got fed and they got to play in front of people every single night. I went on to play with Kronos for eight seasons. I must have played close to a thousand concerts all over the world in many of the, our most celebrated venues. We played, while playing with the band, I premiered hundreds of new works and made dozens of recordings. It was a good run, but my dreams were lying elsewhere. To be honest, the rep was feeling a bit repetitive and I needed more freedom to do my own thing. My wife, composer Paola Pristini, had just, become, had just been asked to become the director of National Sawdust in Brooklyn, so it seemed like the right time to make the switch. But I've been keeping busy. Here's a clip from uh, the music of John Zorn. of tongues 
And in case you're wondering um, what are the crazy effects, this is actually a non-electronic effect piece. I have to put a chopstick through the strings, um, therefore making the A, D, and G strings pretty um, odd sounding. Uh, and I, the percussion you're hearing is my left hand, I'm, I'm whacking the, the, the chopstick and with my right hand I'm playing everything on the C string, essentially. And the pizzicati you're hearing are sometimes behind the bridge and sometimes they're between the chopstick and the bridge. Uh, but it's all uh, what we would call acoustic. Um, now for something a little more electronic, the next work is from my latest solo album entitled The Sound of Science. And this is a piece by uh, Graham Reynolds. Uh, entitled The Brain. Project The Sound of Science uh, was a project that was um, uh, created by myself and Graham Reynolds uh, through Golden Hornet, uh, uh, based in Austin, Texas, and we um, commissioned seven composers to write music uh, inspired by the scientist of their choice. Um, the only parameters that we gave them is that they had to write for solo cello and that um, they had to integrate some type of electronic element and every composer chose a completely different uh, sonic sound world. So it was, it was pretty fun. So what's happening next? You can go ahead and put up the, the next photo. Um, I have begun, just begun a new project with the great Buto dancer Dai Matsuoka directed by Jessica Grindstaff of the Phantom Limb Company. We're calling the project We Were Fridays. I also have some new cello concertos in the works by Andy Akiho and Mark Adamo. Actually, the Mark Adamo concerto was supposed to be premiered at Carnegie Hall uh, a couple months ago, but I think we all know how that story ended up. We're hoping to premiere it either late next season or the following season. I am also involved in a new theatrical cello opera with my wife, Paola Pristini, which is a retelling of Hemingway's Old Man and the Sea. And... I have a new band, a new quartet. We call ourselves Miyamoto is Black Enough. And we have our debut album coming out actually the day after tomorrow on Friday. And here is a uh, music video that we recorded on Juneteenth in quarantine. Now is the right time.
maybe I can garden again. Wield machete and hoe, bust through the earth that eventually forgives. A man is still most alive by the sweat his body can make of its own work until the self leaves the self as salt, returning to the dirt. Maybe this is how to make the body study now, steady now, build a new discipline or retool an old one that can sustain the body which houses the pickled brain and quiets the noisy and restless imps weaving the everlasting quilts of blood. Isn't it after all that the body knows itself and its limits after a night of dancing? Isn't the night closing in on the body at all times except when it moves to push its dark walls back? Plow. Call me grave digger, call me road grader, call me scout. Call me he who makes a way, call me he who avoids the bullet, call me he who takes it. Call me bulletproof, call me never dead, call me resurrect, call me greatest of all time, call me citizen, call me father, call me by my name, call me vine, blade, and the sinews that swing it. Call me the weaver pattern of resistance self, call me revolt, call me revolt, call me revolt, call me revolt. Someone is burning black churches. Someone is setting fire to blackness in the night and watching it be ash by morning. The most American thing we have learned is how to plunder and pretend our robbery was our victim's salvation. In the dream and the man on the roadside too, call me he who builds a church in the night. Call me he who sets it ablaze. Steady now, steady now, sturdy now, stealthy now, build with all the tools. Be Just for a little context, it seems like we wrote that song uh, a couple months ago. Um, Roger, the poet, he's not a rapper or anything like that. He's actually a poet, a slam poetry champion. He wrote that poem about 10 years ago. So um, it kind of speaks to um, how, um, I guess this isn't something new, what we're seeing in the world. So just to close, Paul Katz's words have meant a great deal to me over the years. It is never clear what lies ahead of us, but it is very clear that one always has to find the right balance between artistic growth and survival. The world and therefore the field is constantly changing. As a teacher myself, we, do all, we all do our best to prepare young people for the future based upon what we have learned and experienced in the past. However, the future is always a moving target. Therefore, we must be open to possibility in order to sustain our own careers. After all, you never know what will click. 
And so I think from there, I would like to open things up a bit. If anyone has any questions or thoughts, I know it, I kind of threw a lot out there. And if there's anything that I can um, maybe explain better or uh, I'm sorry, I don't actually have a crystal ball, uh, but I can do my best. Here, should I open up the chat maybe? Um, we actually have a question and kind of comment from our violin faculty, uh, Peter Zazowski. He said, oh, hi. class and presentation, Peter. Jeffrey. Do you remember a festival in Utah in 1999? Um, of course. Of course. And Cypress Park City. Joan Tower and the Muir Quartet, How Time Flies in a Wild Ride. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, I have very fond memories of, of our time together there. I'm Great. sorry that we can't actually be together in the Berkshires this summer. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, as somebody who's very interested in new music and working with living composers, um, what are some words of advice you might have for performers who think their career might turn in that direction? Um, kind of ways as we're about to end college, we could be really proactive in having a career in that musical niche. Any, any advice? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, well, first of all, I, my heart goes out to every musician who just graduated a few months ago. Um, this is, you know, not an easy time for anyone, but I could not imagine starting out my career in, in this particular moment. Um, the only thing I'll say on a positive way is that when we are uh, out of lockdown and we're able to attend performances and live, live things again, uh, I think that we're all going to be hungry and craving for that type of interaction. So uh, hopefully uh, it'll be a flourishing time uh, in years to come. Um, one thing that I will say, though, as far as like advice for uh, young musicians entering, uh, just taking their first steps into the world of new music, is that I think that there's always this... Um, uh, I guess, balance that one has to find uh, between um, uh, finding their voice and uh, taking steps, major steps forward. Um, and what I mean, that was totally vague, but what I mean by that is that it can be very seductive to uh, look at on the, the rosters and look around and see, oh, wow, Philip Glass is like, really popular and he writes music that I love and that that's great. Um, and so I'm going to focus on Philip's music or I'm going to find a way to collaborate with, you know, Steve Reich or, you know, these, you know, giant names in the field. And, and of course, I'm saying this as somebody who has been very fortunate to have worked with with well, with both of them, but many of the um, uh, prominent names in new music. Um, but I would say that the thing that will give you a more sustainable career, I believe, is uh, looking who's to your left and looking to who's to your right. And what I mean by that is that in, you know, great, I've played with Philip Glass, but, you know, I don't mean to say anything mean, but probably in the next few decades, um, you know, Philip won't be with us. And, and then where am I? I'll be, you know, in my 50s or whatnot. And so I think that a more sustainable and a more interesting career is actually to start looking at your colleagues, your fellow classmates, um, maybe, uh, you know, make your contacts now with people in your generation, because maybe they'll want to write you their first violin sonata, but by the time you're both in your 50s, you'll have, they'll have written maybe their fifth or sixth violin sonata for you, and that's your next recording. Um, also, I believe that, um, you know, waters rise, raise all ships. How does the phrase go? So 
Uh, let's say that composer writes you that violin sonata uh, and then you get invited to a music festival and you perform their piece, then that composer has another opportunity to have their, another performance. Likewise, when that composer uh, becomes the, court, the composer in residence at a festival and they want to have their violin sonata performed, then that becomes another performance for, for you. So um, it becomes a much more rich uh, experience be and much more rich relationship between the performer and composer. So um, I think that it's uh, absolutely imperative um, to, um, to look, around, look around you. Also, there's just the simple fact that things kind of go in waves, you know, as life does. Some composers become more popular, some, become, some fall out of style. Composers who are probably huge in the 90s, right now they're struggling for com commissions and performances. So looking at who's at the upper echelon isn't always very beneficial because it might be that when they themselves reach their 70s, their style of composition is no longer considered in vogue. Um, not that you should follow the trends, um, because you should also follow your voice. So if you have an affinity for, let's say, minimalist style music, then absolutely you should become a, a champion for minimalist music. However, I would say that minimalism has been a very, very strong form in the field for about 40 years. And it's probably high time for a change. And I would imagine that change is happening soon. I think that uh, it's very unusual for a style of composition to be so prominent for so long. So um, I, if, <laughs> I, I, I have no crystal ball, but I would imagine that the pendulum is gonna swing the other way sometime soon. Okay, thank you for that. That was an excellent, very thorough answer. Um, we don't have any other audience questions. Um, so I'm gonna ask one more, maybe before closing. Um, you can do it in light of where we are now in quarantine um, or just in general. I was very intrigued when you said um, when you had finished with minimalism and the idea of the pendulum swinging the other way, are there any small trends kind of popping up as a result of quarantine or just with um, musical genres changing that you think might become more prominent in the next few years? Um, I haven't personally seen uh, much change in the um, the new music world as far as you know what um, stylistically what kinds of voices are being pushed forward um, I think that I mean stylistically I do think that the world is changing very rapidly as far as the um, the kinds of voices that are given more attention. I think a lot of that is um, long overdue, quite frankly. Uh, although I do, as uh, somebody who is black in America, I do feel a little bit like people are trying, frantically trying to scramble to find their nearest black friend. Um, but, um, so I have mixed feelings about it, but I do think that it's high time that there are more black and people of, uh, voices of people of color uh, being uh, represented and also making choices, uh, not just being commissioned, but also being the people who are calling shots. So um, I think that as far as any significant pendulum swing, uh, that's the only one that I've seen uh, over the last, you know, four months or so. Before COVID, I, I was kind of seeing a little bit more of a um, uh, desire for more complex music. I mean, the way that I see it, if I, if I had to 
have a, like a total overly simplified uh, explanation. Uh, minimalism, uh, you know, you have the, the traditional uptown and downtown um, styles of music near, in the New York scene. And the uptown just basically, they lost the Cold War, basically. And it's all been downtown. Um, and then what happened is probably at the point that things should have shifted away, uh, Brooklyn kind of got on the map. So then there almost became this alliance between the downtown scene and the Brooklyn scene. And so minimalism as a classical style blended more with, I would say, rock forms. You've probably all heard things like indie classical and things like that. So. Um, it became very appealing for rock people to be recognized as real composers and it became very uh, desirable for classical musicians to work with rock people because it added a lot of cred for both sides. Um, but it, it, you know, at its worst it got a little saccharine and I do think that there's a little bit more of, uh, I wouldn't call it uptown, but let's say neo-complex Neo complexity that's kind of reemerging in a lot of uh, voices in in this scene, um, but it's still way too early to say if that um, has any real traction. The only thing I would say again is that um, there is definitely uh, a lot more um, attention being given to bringing in more diverse voices into the field, and um, and there too I say great and. We, let's see what happens. <laughs> so I, I hope that that is uh, a growing trend. I absolutely agree. I definitely think diversity in our field is something we've always strived for. But in, in light of recent events, it's been a big push lately. Um, so hopefully it gains momentum and just continues both with people of color and women in music and all of that LGBTQ. Um, social, <laughs> social <laughs> movements, well, social movements paralleling the musical movements. Um, and it just kind of, in an ideal world, it feeds into one another and helps them flourish and grow together, mm -hmm. um, gain recognition. So, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I call you professor because I see you in New York. Professors. Yes. <laughs> um, but thank you so much both in helping me with the Bolcom and also enriching the rest of our viewers with your experience and just your knowledge in the modern music field. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me and, and thank you so much for to the Berkshires High, High Peaks Festival for hosting this and Yehuda Hanani for your vision uh, for an amazing festival. And um, I look forward to seeing everyone in person someday soon. Hopefully soon, yes. Hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We had a Lynn masterclass in the evening with our faculty member, Irina. And if you want to check out more High Peaks Zoom presentations, master classes, we still have a few events coming up this week. And I will include that in our chat so you guys can check that out if you like after we close. And if you missed any talks, they're all archived on the Close Encounters with Music YouTube channel. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you again. Um, Ziegler, and we hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone.